Hello, my name is Alex Isles, and in today's episode, we're going to be looking at Jupiter, the greatest and the best, and one of its aspects, Jupiter Dolichentis. So welcome back. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at Jupiter and Jupiter Dolichentis. So Jupiter is a really interesting deity. As we've looked at with Mars and Venus previously, let's look at where Jupiter comes from. So he probably starts off very early on as an italic deity, Dispater, or a sky father. And you can even see some of that left over in his name as Jupiter, Pater, or father right there. So he is the sky father, an Indo-European deity who has then survived into the italic myths and then is adopted or brought in through the evolution of the Roman mythology to become Jupiter as we see him in the Roman myths. He's very similar to obviously the Italic Dispater and alongside this as well, the Etruscantina. When he's similar to those gods, the Etruscantina is a very massive influence on Jupiter as a deity because he's a sky god and he's quite different from the Greek Zeus. Even though there's aspects later on when the Romans start interacting more with the Greeks that they adopt the Greek mythology, Jupiter's character is quite different to Zeus's character in the way that he is presented. So that comes from the Etruscans and the Italics and those style of gods right there. His symbols are the eagle and the lightning bolts. And obviously the eagle becomes the symbol of Rome itself. So when the eagle is the symbol of Rome, that is then um, from Jupiter himself. It's a creature of the sky, it's a massive bird, and it's got a power as a, um, as a predatory animal. So again, that's an aspect of Jupiter with his power and his ability to bring both judgment from the sky, like an eagle hitting a prey animal, or like a lightning bolt that comes out of nowhere and would strike trees, people, things like that. And so you can see that within Jupiter's characteristics. He's seen as this god of judgment, he's this god of power, and also has a slight military aspect as well, because sometimes he was paired with victory, or he would be got Jupiter the provider, all of those different aspects that the Romans, when they needed to, they would create another aspect of the god that they would worship. It's very interesting as well when we look at the history of this, because Numa Pompeius, who was the second king of Rome, was said to have sat down with Jupiter and actually discussed how the Roman religious system would work. Now, what I find really interesting there is, is this a myth mythological um, explanation for an actual synod? And I use the Christian term synod when a group of bishops come together to discuss a theological issue. Well, in the same way, is this a synod in a similar way where leading men of Rome are coming together to discuss what the actual Roman religious system will look like, what parts will they adopt from other people, how are they going to do their religious practices, things like that. Then it's made into mythology with the idea of Numa Pompeia sitting down with Jupiter himself and creating the Roman mythological system. And so when you've got stuff like that, it's really exciting to look at it and go, is this an actual real historical event or is it something that is just a mythology that's built up afterwards because of the fact that he instituted a lot of religious reforms at those times and when he instituted those religious reforms they've then been built into the mythology of the early kings of Rome because he's seen as one of the better kings, one of the good kings rather than the later kings who obviously then result in Rome becoming a republic and then that's a big part of Roman history. The Romans view themselves as not being ruled by kings which again is really interesting because obviously Jupiter is the king of the gods which becomes easier for the Romans later on when you have the emperor because then the emperor, he's not a king, he's an emperor, and he is ruling with the authority from the Senate until later imperial power comes through in the Domine, where it's actually from the power of the army where they draw it, and the imperial power becomes focused very much on the emperor, and they ignore the Senate, whereas in earlier times the emperor always drew power from the Senate and had to be legitimized by the Senate, because they looked at the old sort of system of dictators, which would be temporary leadership, from obviously uh, the Republic. And then that was how they sort of styled themselves. It's quite an interesting one right there. Now with this as well, you've also got to understand that Jupiter is responsible for oath-taking and he's also responsible for uh, justice. 
And when he's responsible for those, you can actually see this in modern day English because sometimes when people make an exclamation um, and maybe they're being a little bit satirical nowadays, they will say, by Jove! And that is actually a Roman uh, oath that was taken in the past where the Romans would swear by Jupiter to say, you know, this is truthful, this is honest, this is an oath that I will fulfill. And so when you've got that aspect of justice and the aspect of oath taking, he is also important for the judicial system, for the lawmaking system and for the structure of society. So those are all big important parts of how we should view Jupiter. What we'll do now is we're going to look at some of his altars from the northern frontier on Hiatrin's Wall and have a look at them as well and understand how the, re the religious aspect of Jupiter would have been seen for Roman soldiers up here on the northern frontier. So just behind me here you can see altars dedicated to Jupiter. Now just to start off you can see this one right here. So right here we have so right here behind me we have some of the altars dedicated on Hadrian's wall to Jupiter. So just starting off here this one behind me says to Jupiter the greatest and the best that's the IOM at the top uh, dedicated by the prefect which you can just see down here of the fourth cohort of Gauls and that's from Vindolanda Roman Fort. Here we have another one of the altars dedicated by the prefect of the cohort of Spaniards and just along here as well you can see a lot of the altars that have been discovered in Maryport in Cumbria. Now with Jupiter being obviously the head of the gods, the king of the gods, this most important figure, the heads of the auxiliary units on Hadrian's wall were incredibly important to represent the power of the emperor because these prefects they came, claimed their power from the emperor. So when you're inside the headquarters building of a Roman fort, the headquarters building would have a statue of the emperor and then a plinth where the commander would stand and address his troops. So when he's addressing his troops, what he's doing is he's actually saying, right, I draw authority from the emperor and the emperor draws divine authority through the deity Jupiter. So when he draws divine, divine authority from Jupiter, the commander is then responsible for praying for the health of the emperor and also at the same time recognizing imperial authority through the cult of Jupiter as well. And so every single year there would be a sacrifice of a white ox or white lambs depending on the different uh, times of the year and things like that. And then they would create these altars where the prefect would dedicate these and they're actually really useful because they are useful to us today because we can actually date if we have the military records of these commanding officers as they travel throughout the empire when these have been set up. Because let's say the commander stays there and the commanders were normally on these war forts for three to five years at most. And this is actually where today in modern military systems commanding officers of many military units will only stay a commanding officer of that unit or a colonel in the British army, that's the level we're talking about, for the unit for about three years. And that's so that the, he then can also be promoted, but then you don't get military uh, stagnant, stagnancy. And in the worst case scenario, the troops don't become overly loyal to him. And so because of that, um, you would then, in the same way in the Roman system, these guys would be here for a certain amount of time, and then they would either be promoted to another unit or moved to another unit or go into a civic role and another part of the empire. So we can track them through their careers and when we track them through their careers we can then say all right he's set up this altar here we understand this time bracket is when this commander would have been commander at this fort. And so when they dedicate these to Jupiter there will be a sacrifice of probably a white oxen then after that they would put it up in a location and there's probably an area of the fort where all of these would be set up. So you could see them and you would see all the dedications to Jupiter. Now at Maryport, very interestingly, they were excavating and they found a post-Roman or a late Roman building, a great hall. And when they'd been building this hall, it was a wooden framed hall. And when it was a wooden framed hall, to create the foundations, they'd actually taken all of these altars to Jupiter and they'd buried them in the ground and used them as the footing posts for the hall. Now when archaeologists first found it, they thought that maybe at the end of every year what would happen is that they would take these altars dedicated to Jupiter and when they took these altars dedicated to Jupiter they would bury them in the ground and then the next one would be put up. And that was what the current belief until they realized that they were footing posts for this hall. And so the current interpretation is that they stopped being Roman pagans 
what they did is they actually then started going, all right, what we'll do now is we've got a load of these good stone blocks around the place, but we're Christian now. So we don't need these. These mean nothing to us. They're actually dedications to a false god or, or an idol. And so because of that, they then took them, put them in the ground, and they became the foundation supports for the post holes. And so it's just a recycling. And you know, some people might think this might be insulting to the previous religious system or something like that. But the Romans were actually really famous for recycling. And they were really quite good at it. In fact, in Rome, there seems to have been like a, a stonemason's yard where previous emperor, emperor's buildings or previous emperor's you know, statues, when they had stopped being useful, would have been gathered together. And then when a new emperor wanted to make a, a building or something like that, they would then go along and they would take previous parts of previous arches, previous buildings, stuff like that, and then they would build them into the new arch. So instead of having to go and quarry and make something brand new, you'd just be able to recycle something previously. And we also see this in statues as well. You know, when a statue was put up to one emperor, you know, you could keep the body and then just change the facial features slightly, recarve it. And then suddenly, yes, bam, straight away, you've got the emperor's statue and you don't have to go through all the cost and expense. So in the same way, in the late Roman period, when they're building this great hall that is now an important part of the community gathering there, or a meeting place, or it could be a living space, much like what we see with the Anglo-Saxons um, with their great halls as well, they've just gone, we need to put the footings in, we need to have good stable foundations, and so these altars to Jupiter were then used. But because of that, we can then look through and we can say which unit was stationed at the fort, who was the commander, and get a lot of information. And so we can date a lot of the time of the fort and understand the fort's history from these. And so these dedications, which are so important, that tell us that they were worshipping and honouring Jupiter the greatest and the best by the prefects of these units, who obviously were almost in a Jupiter-like role over the soldiers. They were the, the head of that unit, and in the same way, the head of the local community, because in a civilian settlement outside, when you want justice, when you want law and order, when you want to make an oath, or you want to do, you know, show that you are making a decision, you're going to go in front of this commander, and you're going to make that oath, or that, that make that um, legal decision in front of the commander of the unit because this commander of the unit is the closest thing to imperial authority in the local area. And then when he needs to make a decision, he goes to the regional governor, or in the later period, the ducks. And then, then if the ducks can't make a decision, they go to the emperor. So all imperial authority, well, so all authority comes back to the emperor, and the emperor then draws his authority from the gods and the Roman system as a whole and the spirit of Rome. So that's a little bit of a, the history right there. It understands how Jupiter fits in and how commanders would want to honour Jupiter because they're drawing authority from Jupiter through the emperor. What we'll do next is we'll now look at one of Jupiter's aspects, Jupiter Dolichenis, and we'll talk about him in the next section of the video. So welcome back. Here we have Jupiter Dolichenis. Now, Jupiter Dolichenis is an aspect of Jupiter, and he was adopted, and we see his worship from the end of the second century on the Antonine Wall, and in East Lothian, not far away from Edinburgh, there is actually a temple and a shrine to Jupiter, Jupiter Dolichenis found on the Antonine Wall and on the northern frontier. So we know in the late second century, he's been worshipped within the Roman system. Now, the interesting thing about him is that the Romans would adopt foreign gods. And when they adopted foreign gods, they would then synchronize them with their own deities. When they adopted these gods, they would represent them in the way that they understood the foreigner. Now, the Romans were very happy with using racial stereotypes. So, for instance, Jupiter Dolichenus wears a Phrygian cap. And the Romans, in art, when they want to represent an Easterner, they're all wearing Phrygian caps. And it's a way of quickly and easily saying this person is Eastern. And so because of that, they're easy to say, right, the stereotypes that we believe about foreigners of the East are like this. And so they had a set of tropes that would be an understanding of an Easterner. So when you're depicting these gods, they would take a, a, a named god, Dolichenus, and then they basically brought him into the Roman pantheon, but he wouldn't be the same way he'd be worshipped back in Syria, where he was originally from. And so when he was from Syria and, and uh, southern Turkey, that area there, 
he would have certain aspects and he was actually closer to the Canaanite and Phoenician Baal. And so the Romans took that idea, took Dolichenus, but they wanted him for his almost uh, stereotype of an Easterner. And also, interestingly enough, he seems to have also had a healing aspect as well. And then when they took that, they then brought him into the Roman system, synchronized him with Jupiter, and then had him right there. So they really went to town with some of the Eastern stereotypes. As I mentioned before, he's got the Phrygian cap on. You can see in this altar right here, he's holding a labrys, which is a double-headed axe, which was associated with kingship, but also with the Thracians as well. So another Eastern culture. He's holding lightning bolts in his other hand, which is again representing Jupiter, and he stood upon a bull. When he stood upon a bull, that was representing virility, it was representing strength, it was representing power. And so you've got some nice symbols there, which are both Eastern symbols, but also key symbols that the Romans would recognize within their own religious system. When you've got these aspects here, he becomes an important part of the Roman religious system throughout the third century, because the new dynasty that comes in is the Severan dynasty, started off by Septimius Severus. Now Septimius Severus, he himself is a North African. And when he's a North African, he is of Punic descent, so from the Carthaginians, Rome's great enemy. But he's a Romanized Carthaginian, and his mother's family was also from Italy. And so when you've got that, he's got an Italian family mixed with a Carthaginian family, and he's very proud of both of his descents. When you've got that going on, he marries a priestess from Syria. And so because of that, he is seen as a bit of a foreigner, he's a bit of an outsider to the Roman system, but he's also a Roman. He then starts using the cult of Jupiter Dolichenes throughout the empire, and he's a big fan of Jupiter Dolichenes alongside some other cults as well. And so that spreads out through the military. Now, Jupiter Dolichenes is always depicted in military garb, which is, uh, so he's depicted wearing a cuirass, which is the breastplate, and he's shown wearing military greaves and stuff like that as well. But in the third century, that's a symbol of power. As the emperors become more militaristic, then that's seen as normal imperial garb. And the emperors are always depicted also wearing um, military garb as well during this sort of time. So again, it's not necessary that he's a war god. It's just that he's shown wearing the garments of power. So the Severans then sponsored the cult of Ju uh, Jupiter Dolichenes, but the military figures then adopted it. Because then it, when it's associated with that dynasty, they can then worship Jupiter Dolichenes. And when they worship Jupiter Dolichenes, that becomes really quite important for the emperor's health, the emperor's well-being. And you can worship him and then pray for the health and the success of the dynasty. It becomes a very, very important cult. And up on the northern frontier, there are actually quite a few of these uh, temples dedicated to him. And so just to give you an idea, they are all over the northern frontier. They found, they found temples, the Jupiter Dolichenes, in Brewcastle, Old Penrith, Risingham, Cloy Hill, Chesters, Vindolanda, and Corbridge. So you've got them all along the frontier, both uh, north of the wall and on the wall itself. This worship would have been very much connected to the Septimian, uh, Septimian dynasty. When it's connected to the Septimian dynasty, um, you also see this at Vindolanda as well. And so you've got this wonderful altar behind me right here, which was a part of the temple at the fort. And there were dedications by the prefect of the second cohort of Nervans and the prefect also of the fourth cohort of Gauls. So it's being used by different commanders and different units and being worshipped on the frontier. You've also got this hand which was found within one of the ditches outside the fort. And there's a question, is it being ritually deposited there or is it actually uh, just being thrown away when the cult is no longer useful? But this here, this hand, is thought to be the golden hand of Jupiter Dolichenes. And when it's seen to be that, it's associated with healing, it's associated with good health, and you find them wherever there is a temple to Jupiter Dolichenes. And so maybe at the end of the use of the temple, it's just being thrown into the ditch and just got rid of because the cult started to become less popular. Alongside the cult being associated with the health of the emperor, there was also a female deity, Juno Regina, who was also really quite important. And Juno Regina possibly was associated with the empress, Julia Domina. And Julia Domina was Septimius Septimus's wife. And so her being associated with the goddess Juno Regina 
and when you've got Juno Regina, um, she would be in the same temples as Jupiter Dolichenus. So you've got almost these two deities which have been adopted by the imperial couple, Septimia Severus and Julia Domina, to then be represented within cult locations um, throughout the empire. And when you've got these cult locations, you can see this very well at Chester's Roman Fort. And just on the screen right now, you should be able to see a statue of Juno Regina that was found at Chester's. Now, when you've got this amazing statue, had it been in marble, this would have been one of the most famous statues from Roman Britain, but it's made of local sandstone instead, which therefore has made it seem as less important. But it's beautifully carved, and at the bottom, you can just see the fact that she's standing on a heifer. So just like Jupiter Dolichenus is standing on a bull, as you can see behind me, the empress, uh, empress's deity, um, Juno Regina, is standing on a heifer. And so within the temple, there may have been a male statue and a female statue of the deities side by side, so you could pray to the health of the imperial couple. And she, her cult would have been side by side with Jupiter Dolichenus. So you can see how the fact that the imperial couple are using these cults to actually help strengthen their power and strengthen their authority within the empire, as, as Septimia Severus's power is very very rocky. He doesn't use senatorial power, instead he uses military power to continue his control of the empire and he actually pretty much ignores the senate which sets up the imperial power for the whole of the third century and causes a lot of trouble throughout the whole of the Roman Empire, uh, eventually leading to what at the death of uh, Severus Alexander, the last of his dynasty in a AD 235, for basically what's called the crisis of the third century, a period of 50 years of civil war within the Roman Empire. So upon the death, so on the death of Severus Alexander um, in two, AD 235, there is a new emperor, Maximus Frax. And Maximus Frax is an Illyrian. So Maximus Frax comes into power, and when he comes into power, he actually starts persecuting the cult of Jupiter Dolichenus. And he just goes through the Rhineland, through Gaul, and other places in the empire, and he just destroys the temples, confiscates the wealth, and just goes through and just destroys all of them, and just basically really oppresses the cult of Jupiter Dolichenus. Now, there's a lot of different understandings of why this may be. One of them is that they, he was basically coming in as an Illyrian, and he just wanted to get rid of anything about the previous dynasty. He was getting rid of the Severans, getting rid of their cult connections, and it was seen that the cult, cult of Jupiter Dolichenus was highly connected to the Severan dynasty. So it was a way of basically saying, cut your ties to the previous dynasty, there's new people in town, get rid of your connections, and we are now in power. The other possibility is that he was needing wealth and money quickly, and so by taking out uh, what was seen as a sort of a foreign cult within the empire, even though it was connected to Jupiter, he could get that money quickly. And so that may have been another um, reason for his persecution of the cult of Jupiter Dolichenus. What really sealed the end of the power, though, of the cult was when Shapur I um, came through. And Shapur I was a Persian king, and he came through... And he destroyed the cult center of Dolichen, which was when Jupiter Dolichenus was from. So when he captured it, destroyed it, it was seen that the god wasn't even able to protect his own cult center. And so if he wasn't able to protect his own cult center, why are you even praying to him? So the fact is that the Romans saw power in the deity's locations and whether or not the deities could also fight back and protect themselves. So when Shapur I destroys that, Suddenly, Jupiter Dolichenus is no longer as an attractive, a, a powerful deity, because unlike maybe Jupiter or other gods as well, he isn't able to defend his own locations. And so when he's in, unable to defend it, you just go, right, no more. We're not going to worship this god because his power is gone. And also maybe as well, because he is sort of seen as corrupted in some way by connection to this Septimian dynasty. And so you just want to distance yourself from that and focus on the current imperial dynasty instead. So I really hope you've enjoyed today's episode and looking at Jupiter and his aspect Jupiter Dolichenus and understanding how they fit into both the Roman world but also alongside that as well the military frontier up in the northern part of the empire on Hadrian's Wall. As always please do like and subscribe, share the video with your friends and I do have a Patreon as well if you would like to support me on that. But until next time stay safe and well and I hope you'll join me for another video in the near future.